Dr. Nalini Saman Singh, a uh, very renowned astronomer, world astronomer, will be delivering the talk on uh, understanding comets, evolving perspectives over the years. And uh, to carry on with the uh, event, I would like to call upon uh, Professor Harvan uh, Ratnachunda. Sir? Thank you, Chintaka, for that introduction. Uh, I am, we are here at Section E1 uh, at uh, the Astronomical Society of Sri Lanka, which I was a member of for long years, and Nalini also remember And uh, this about six, maybe about six months ago, when sort of I got an email from Asoka saying that he has published this book. And I think a lot of us knew the book was existing, but didn't know where to actually buy a copy. And I suggested that we have this launch so that people know they can come, who are interested can come and buy a copy. Uh, let me start the proceedings by giving, gifting, launching the book by giving a copy to our speaker. That is our speaker. The book uh, has been published by Asoka Mendes and he has gifted the whole, uh, all the books to the Foundation of Goodness and all proceeds from the book sales will be going to the Foundation of Goodness. So those of you who have not bought a copy, please buy a copy. It's, uh, it, all the proceeds go to a worthy cause. So let me start the proceedings by reading briefly a small uh, a uh, uh, biography of uh, Professor Asoka Mendes so that you know uh, who uh, they... Asoka Mendes is my, must be the second most senior, second or third most senior Sri Lankan to do astrophysics abroad. I think the most senior is Chandra Victor Singer. Same batch. Same batch, okay. Chandra Vikram Singer and Nasoka Mendes are sort of uh, contemporaries and actually lead the uh, sort of the astronomy, astronomers from Sri Lanka. I think there has been uh, maybe about 10 or 15 more who have sort of uh, one of you, uh, myself and Nalin, and then about 10 or 15 more who have done PhDs and are actively in research. I happen to be the only one who is back in Sri Lanka now switched to a different field. And uh, Nalin continues to uh, do astrophysics in the uh, US with comets, and he was the ideal uh, speaker for this uh, book launch because Nalin's field of research is on comets, and that's what Asoka Mendes mainly did on. He did done in the, uh, a lot of uh, interstellar so applied star physics so I think uh, basically he was the best thing so when I the book had to be launched and run I, heard, I knew that Nalin was coming uh, over for a short visit to Sri Lanka I sort of uh, invited him and organized this event uh, let me read briefly about uh, Professor Asoka Mendes. Professor Asoka Mendes was born in Sri Lanka and is presently in the United States citizen, having received his BSc and degree of mathematics from the University of Ceylon and having lectured in mathematics, uh, mathematics department for several years. He proceeded to England on, the, uh, on a university scholarship in 1964 and obtained his PhD in astrophysics from the Victoria University of Manchester in 1967. The same university conferred him the deg uh, degree of Doctor of Science on him in 1978 for his uh, research contributions to cosmic physics. Following his return to Sri Lanka in 1967, he lectured for two more years in the Department of Mathematics. In 1969, he joined the Faculty of Applied Electron Physics and subsequently the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering in the University of California, San Diego, and retired as a distinguished professor in 1994. Since then, he has continued 
his research as a emeritus professor at UCSD, where he has been recognized as a member of the founding faculty. Professor Mendes uh, research ex 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 uh, ex extensively over the uh, over a wide area of astrophysics, planetary and cometary physics, space physics, physics of dusty plasma and quantum plasma over a long career spanning of almost five decades. He is perhaps best known for his pioneering work on the physics of comets and the physics of dusty plasma, a field in which he has been described as the founder. Among the early astrophysical research, uh, particularly noteworthy is his contributions to the interstellar gas dynamics in the vicinity of newly formed stars. Uh, foremost among Professor Mendes's interests outside the scientific research is his abiding uh, concern for the explosive growth of the world's human population and the attendant problems over consumption of resources and environmental pollution. Among his other interests is tra travel to exotic places. Professor Mendes resides with his wife, uh, Jan, in San Diego. California, where they have been lived for over 45 years. I sort of have actually visited Ahsoka one or two times in San Diego, and he is a very nice person, and I'm glad that he has written this book, which I think has a would be of interest to anybody who wants to act, take astronomy as a career path. That's not an easy career path to take from Sri Lanka. I know that because when I selected to wanted to be an astronomer, my mother thought I was nuts. Basically, you have to get a job. You need to sort of do a proper job in Sri Lanka means getting into doing being an engineer or a doctor. And I sort of uh, broke away from that. And I think anybody who is interested in astronomy and going wanting to do astronomy, you get a lot of inspirations by reading this book. So it's very nice that he has written not only his background, he has sort of traced his roots back to the uh, ancient times of Sri Lanka, as well as then gone on to saying what inspired him to do astronomy and his full career. So uh, let me now go ahead and introduce our speaker, uh, Nalin Sam uh, Samar Singer. He's a senior scientist currently residing in Tucson, Arizona. Uh, Dr. Samar Singer obtained his Bachelor of Science in Physics from the University of Colombo, graduating with first class honors in 1981. He received his master's degree in astronomy from the University of Maryland. College Park in 1985 and his PhD in 1992. He has been a research mentor for many undergraduates and graduate students. He is active in current activities and co-investigator of many outreach grants. Dr. Samar Singer's research interests are focused on the study of comets and other small bodies of the solar system. His studies include understanding of physics and chemistry of cometary nuclei and coma, including rotational studies of nuclei and interpretation of coma morphologies. The structural properties of small bodies in the solar system, the rotational and physical properties of trans-Neptunian objects, and the physical properties of asteroids. He happens to be one of two Sri Lankan astronomers who have a minor planet, and that's an asteroid named after him. One, two, eight, seven, eight, seven, one, seven, six. So, and he has not only done that, he has named a few others after press, got others in, or proposed that got others such that asteroids named after Andron, Urus, Sikiri, and a few others. So far. Okay. So, which much ado, I pass on the podium to Nalin, and if you don't mind, I'll go down and sit downstairs. Thank you, Pawan and uh, Chintaka, and also uh, both the Sri Lanka Association for the Advancement of Science, Section E1, and uh, Sri Lanka Astronomical Association for organized 
organizing this event and uh, inviting me. And uh, I uh, spoke to Asoka before leaving, uh, and uh, he expressed his uh, inability to be here in person uh, due to uh, health issues. But uh, uh, he convinced his uh, best wishes for the event. And uh, uh, I really encourage you, Kavan gave an introduction, uh, excellent introduction about the book. And uh, also, uh, uh, the book contains a uh, lot of material, materials uh, about uh, uh, science, how things have been accomplished, etc. But uh, there are various uh, uh, items uh, which will make you laugh and uh, uh, try to continue. For one example uh, is that uh, he was quoting a friend of uh, his uh, uh, Japanese colleague uh, who had, was stating that uh, if you have a American car and a Japanese wife, you will be happy. So Asuka says uh, he has a, a Japanese car and an American wife and he is uh, very happy. So, so uh, apart from those, uh, I really encourage you to buy the book and it is going for a worthy course uh, foundation of goodness. Uh, it is doing a lot of uh, charitable work uh, throughout Sri Lanka. Uh, and uh, uh, I really encourage you to buy the book. So, uh, Asoka's uh, primary scientific interest, uh, especially in the last couple of decades, was concentrated on dust in plasma physics and actually he can be considered as the father uh, or at least one of the pioneers of dusty space plasma physics. Uh, I'm not an expert on that area, uh, so I will concentrate on mostly on comments where he has uh, worked throughout his career and especially in the 1980s, 70s uh, and a little bit uh, in the 90s too. So, uh, uh, during my talk, I will uh, uh, go back and forth uh, about some of Asoka's contribution uh, to the field of cometary science. So, uh, the talk is titled uh, Understanding Comets Evolving Perspective Over the Years. So, uh, the outline, I will uh, talk about studying comets and why do we want to study comets. And uh, some might think like Calvin mentioned, probably I am nuts. But uh, there are certain reasons uh, uh, when we talk about the broader picture, uh, it will be evident uh, how that is related to uh, uh, we as a human species. And then uh, I will talk about, give a brief introduction to comments and then uh, Asoka's contribution to the field. Uh, of course, I can't do full justice uh, written uh, uh, hopefully less than one hour of talk. Uh, but I will try my best. And uh, then I will talk about uh, briefly comments before the modern era, uh, then the advances in the early and mid 20th century, and then late 20th century and early 21st century. And there was a mission, and probably my own opinion on what should be next. So, the broader picture why we study comments? 
Comets are the least altered objects left over from the formation era of the solar system. Uh, so the solar system was formed. Uh, there were two kinds of objects which are left over. One is comets, and the other one is asteroids. Uh, asteroids form close to the sun, and comets form further out because comets have uh, ice. Uh, so, if, if you look at most of the uh, comets and asteroids, which we call uh, part of the small bodies of the solar system, because the large bodies are planets. Uh, so, out of uh, all the small bodies of the solar system, uh, compared with asteroids, which are undergone an immense amount of collisions, so, uh, their structure uh, has changed over the years a lot, and chemically there were changes. But comparatively speaking, comets have undergone little change from that initial era. Uh, I'm not saying that no changes has occurred, but the changes were comparatively small. So it is a good proof of the early solar system environment, trying to understand uh, how the solar system was formed. And also, planets were the build, build, building blocks of the giant planets, uh, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Similar to asteroids were the building blocks of uh, terrestrial planets, including our own Earth. So, also, uh, it is one of the source of water and organic compounds for the early Earth. Uh, I'm not going to go beyond that. Uh, uh, and the other source is, of course, uh, uh, asteroids. And also, by learning about comets, because there are comets and asteroid impacts happened throughout the 4.6 billion years where the Earth was in existence. So, those impacts will occur, uh, may not be in 100 years, but if we want to mitigate the impact due to those impacts. Uh, that is something which we can achieve. We have more or less the necessary technology. We can't do anything with regard to uh, cyclones or earthquakes other than evacuation from the area. So in that sense, uh, uh, if we know the structure of these objects, we can do effective impact mitigation. So in order to do that, we know, need to know about the structural properties of these objects, uh, both comets and asteroids. So that is something we can do. So at least the money spent on studying these objects uh, will be well spent after we find out something is coming towards us. And then uh, it is a source for uh, space resource mining in the future. Uh, there are, in fact, private companies which are going to mine asteroids right now, uh, which will happen in a uh, few decades. And finally, the pool objects. So, uh, I said pool objects, I have to justify that. So, this is a picture, and this is another picture of common type of target. Um, this is Comet Tailbar. You might remember in 1997, uh, which was very easily a visible eye, unaided eye object. This is uh, another Comet Magnon, 2007, primarily a southern hemisphere object. And um, so all these were uh, things which could be seen from with the unaided eye. And then there were uh, other things that uh, uh, we could see. There are common outbursts, there are splitting events and breakups. So th this is Comet uh, Shoemaker Lv9, which all this, it broke into a number of parts due to the tidal forces of uh, Jupiter, and uh, it uh, impacted uh, 
uh, Jupiter in uh, 1994, uh, July. So effectively that is the 25th anniversary of lunar landing. So the cosmos was reacting to that. Uh, so you see the nice images. This is the uh, other images. And uh, out of these uh, images, which are taken by all my telescopes, but this is also from telescope. This was an outburst of common forms. However, this particular, during this particular event, uh, you could see this uh, from your naked eye. So uh, it got uh, brighter, uh, and uh, the size of the, the outburst material was even larger than the size of the moon. So, so I hope you will create these are cool objects. So next, a brief introduction to comets. So, what is a comet? Comet are small bodies that formed in the outer solar system in the Jack planet region and beyond, which were not got accumulated in the process of forming the giant planets and they were the leftover objects. So, from an observational point of view, a definition of comet to distinguish it from an asteroid, a small body with a detectable bone. Uh, I have certain issues with that definition, but uh, I'm not going to get into that. Uh, uh, but, uh, but right now, that is the definition. Sir, do you have a uh, okay. The only problem is the coma could be dust or gas or combination. So if you look at uh, in the previous image, uh, some of these uh, uh, I'm talking about. Uh, I remember, yeah, this event, this is uh, Sheila, I believe. So, some of the uh, outburst events, uh, they were seen, uh, uh, I, I, I don't have uh, the images here, uh, they were seen uh, basically as, a, uh, as asteroids, but suddenly, they showed a form. So, probably, at least in some cases, uh, that form was produced due to the collision with another asteroid. So, strictly speaking, it is not common in the sense, I would like to have a physical de definition to, uh, for the comet to have isos sublimate. So uh, it is not the same physical process which was going on. So that is why I said I have some concerns. But uh, 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 so it is it is not a perfect uh, definition, but we go with that definition. Uh, so there are certain issues, uh, as I said. And then uh, uh, if you look at uh, a comet. Uh, this is a image of a uh, comet uh, hair bar, uh, which has two tails. This is the dust tail, and this is the plasma tail. Uh, and uh, Asara is an expert on iron tails, physics of iron tails. And uh, right here we have the nucleus, which is a solid object, uh, which we can't see in this particular image uh, because of two reasons. One. It is not resolved, and the other reason is this coma or the atmosphere of the comet, uh, which is not a bound atmosphere like Earth's atmosphere, uh, uh, is basically obscuring the nucleus. Uh, so both the coma and the nucleus are right there, and the typical scale. If you take the nucleus, it is typically of the order of few kilometers 
the coma could be of the order of 10 to the 5 kilometers and the tail could be of the order of 10 to the 7 kilometers of that order. So one thing to note is not there's huge range in spatial scales uh, and the, the number density of particles, the, uh, here it is primarily the dust particles, here uh, various uh, uh, ionized molecules. Uh, they are very graphite gas uh, here and even the dust particles, the dust densities are very, very low. Uh, so to put these numbers into context, uh, suppose the nucleus is the size of a uh, baseball, then the coma is as large as Kalam and the tail can extend all the way uh, up to India and uh, maybe middle of India. So, so those are the scales that we are dealing with. Scales, how the scales come to bear? Uh, Halley, uh, Halley's, it is even larger, probably an order of magnitude larger, but uh, the nucleus size is, uh, it is an elongated nucleus, uh, the effective radius is about uh, 5 kilometers. Uh, and also, uh, I said of the order of 10 to the 5 kilometers for the coma, it depends on what gas species you are talking about. If you are talking about uh, 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 water or then the water will photo dissociate into uh, OH and H and when water photo dissociate into OH and H, uh, basically hydrogen molecules move at much higher speed than the OH molecules because it is basically conservation of linear momentum. So it's about uh, oxygen is uh, 16 times heavier, uh, hydrogen is 1, so 17 to 1 ratio. Uh, so if you look at the, uh, the hydrogen coma, that would be 17 times more larger uh, than uh, OH coma. So, I mean, these are just rough numbers. So, so I want to give the physical uh, sense as to the kind of scales involved. And on the other hand, if the Earth is uh, the size of a basketball, Earth's atmosphere is as thin as a piece of paper. So you will realize uh, the kind of uh, scales in all. And that is one reason why both the material in the coma as well as the nucleus, uh, sorry, uh, the coma as well as the tail, uh, they are very rarefied. So, uh, the nucleus consists of ices and dust, uh, and when the comet, or the, rather the nucleus comes close to the sun, ice sublimates, that is basically going from the solid state to the gas state and the coma is formed by outflowing gases drag the dust particles into the coma and the solar radiation pressure repairs that dust grains away from the nucleus forming the dust layer and then uh, uh, there are other physical processes going on in the coma such as pollution, photo dissociation, photoionization, etc. and those, those physical processes cause the destruction of ex existing gas species and creation of new gas species. Uh, uh, similarly, water will photo pho dissociate into H and O. So, and radiation pressure acts on those gas species too. Uh, as far as the tails are concerned, solar wind drags ionized gas molecules, creating the plasma tail uh, or the iron tail, and the velocities are typically few hundred kilometers per second compared with the dust velocities in the dust tail which is uh, few tens to less than uh, kilometer per second. So those are the scales associated. 
Now uh, I would like to talk about uh, some of uh, Asuka's schedule on how much science. Hope I didn't get uh, anybody miss. Uh, so I ordered this based on the the number of uh, peer review publications and uh, uh, Asoka has published and his students with his students he has published number of uh, publications on uh, comedy science uh, primarily in the 70s and 80s and then uh, I have done and uh, Chandra Vikram Singh has done most of uh, his work in the context of uh, justifying uh, panspermia and uh, his brother Dal Vikram Singh also I think had one or two uh, publications uh, during Harvard Harris time uh, actually part of my uh, PhD dissertation was on uh, Harvard Harris and uh, now uh, some of you may know Prasanna Desha Priya uh, uh, he's a graduate student in uh, Paris uh, he is working on uh, uh, Rosetta spacecraft data of Hamad Cherimeo Gerasimeo so uh, uh, there are only about uh, 15 or so Sri Lankan astronomers and especially when you look at uh, comets, it is a very small field compared with extra galactic astronomy, uh, stellar astronomy, galactic astronomy, and uh, even uh, planetary astronomy, which is a subfield of uh, uh, planetary astronomy. Uh, uh, comets is not, uh, a subfield of planetary astronomy. So, in that sense, uh, there are a lot of uh, Sri Lankans who have. Uh, uh, Comparatively large percentage of Sri Lankans who have worked on comet science. I uh, hope I can get uh, anybody's name with me. Uh, so, uh, some of his contributions uh, uh, with my own biases. Uh, so, uh, Asoka's work with his student David Brain who is now a science fiction writer, a good science fiction writer, I should say. Uh, they looked at uh, dust mantle developing on comets. Basically, um, when the outgassing happens, the volatiles, the ices sublimates from comet, uh, there will be dust layer uh, left over on comets. So uh, there was a uh, lot of work done by Mendes and Green. And uh, so this was uh, quoted from uh, a chapter in Howard's two book uh, that is uh, uh, the last uh, major uh, scientific publication related to Howard's uh, review publication, uh, which was published in 2004. Uh, I have a chapter there on rotation. Uh, now, actually, it is time to have another book, especially after the Rosetta mission. Uh, and also, uh, he suggested the possibility of X-rays from Comet Vinforma in the 1970s with the Vinforma Hip. Wing Hip is a, uh, a scientist, a uh, very interesting guy. Uh, who started from, I think he was born in Nan, uh, Nanjing, uh, China, uh, then uh, went to Macau, lived there, uh, came to the US, worked in uh, uh, Asoka for his PhD, and then went to Max Planck Institute in Germany, and now uh, is uh, in Taiwan. So, really nice guy. So, uh, uh, so this was long before X-rays was discovered in Comets. X-rays was discovered in 1996 uh, in Comet Hyperarchy. Uh, uh, they were the first to suggest, uh, even though the physical mechanism uh, happened to be different. So the way which I look at, uh, he was looking both the uh, Asoka and uh, uh, they were looking uh, beyond uh, uh, the box. Uh, so that kind of attitude uh, is 
really important in science. Uh, uh, irrespective of whether a particular physical process is uh, exactly what is responsible or not. So, uh, we learn from mistakes sometimes. Uh, uh, that is how science progresses. Uh, so, uh, and then of course, uh, his main area, uh, physics of dust plasmas and uh, charged dust particles. Uh, the dynamics of charged dust particles in the cometary environment. Uh, Asoka has done uh, pioneering work uh, in this area. And uh, uh, I had met Asoka in the 1970s when I was a uh, uh, student in schools. And also, uh, uh, I was at the university uh, in the late 70s. Uh, and when I started uh, my uh, graduate student career in Sri Lanka. So, uh, there is a lot of uh, 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 pioneering work that he has done in this field in addition to uh, uh, how much, uh, sorry, uh, dust spray, the space plasma he is well known. So, uh, this is uh, some of his publications, I don't know whether uh, those of you who are the, the back of the room can uh, see uh, some of his publications uh, uh, ranked according to the citation and uh, uh, the first few were on dusty space plasma and then he had a monograph with two of his students, Goethe's uh, and Max Marconi. Uh, Max Marconi is uh, still active uh, and then uh, his uh, work with uh, David Green, uh, another student of his, uh, on the uh, dust release and mantle development in Thomas, the circus of uh, commentary, uh, of commentary nuclei. And uh, so uh, he was uh, uh, high, highly involved in uh, uh, common alley exploration by. Uh, because uh, there were Europeans and Soviet Union at that time. Uh, there, were, there was no U.S. spacecraft uh, uh, sent uh, to uh, uh, Comet Halley or rather flyby, but uh, he was involved in uh, uh, those uh, Soviet and uh, uh, Jato uh, missions. So uh, uh, now I will uh, following the basic theme of the lecture, uh, I will uh, briefly mention about how much before the modern era and as you know, uh, if you look at both the uh, uh, Eastern and Western cultures, uh, how much were considered to be the messengers of uh, impending doom or bad luck. Uh, even today, uh, that is the case unfortunately. Uh, hope it will change. Uh, but uh, one thing to note is uh, uh, there are historical recordings of commentary appearances dating back over many millennia and especially the Chinese recordings uh, of Hamad Kali dates back to over two millennia. In fact, those measurements uh, which mentioned about the location of Hamad Kali uh, they, they didn't know it was common Halley, uh, but they said this and this year uh, there was an object uh, with this kind of shape and uh, characteristics appeared in this particular location uh, in the sky. So those measurements were used by astronomers to find out what we call the non-gravitational forces, I will explain what it is. Uh, so, Harman Halley was nearly constant over 2000 years. So, the non-gravitational forces is when uh, this ice is sublimates, uh, there is jetting going on. So, it's like a jet. Uh, so, if you think about the water hose, uh, when you open that, when water starts flowing, there is a reaction force, uh, a backward reaction force. 
So similarly, uh, there is an equivalent uh, effect going on in comets also. And that effect will change the orbit as well as the rotation state of the comet nucleus. So, so the location of these Chinese records uh, were helpful in determining uh, the non-gravitational forces. No, they are called non-gravitational because it is not gravitational. Uh, uh, those are mere constant over 2,000 years, and that put certain constraint on uh, identifying uh, how the nuclear activity occurs, uh, how long the activity on a certain location of the common nucleus would last, and things like that. So, uh, uh, next I will uh, uh, talk about early and mid 20th century. So, one question that, uh, uh, one profound question that we had was what was the common nucleus like? So, there are two uh, leading theories in the mid 1900s. What was, one was called the sandbag model of the nucleus uh, and uh, they argued the nucleus is basically a, a gravitationally bound swarm of dust particles with that sort of gases and the competing model was uh, what we call the Isaac Conglomerate model of the nucleus uh, which was proposed by Fred Whipple in 1950. Uh, it is just a single body containing ices and dust. So, uh, when the spacecraft flew by Common Harry uh, in 1986, uh, it became clear this is not the right, the first one is not the right uh, description of the common nucleus. And uh, now uh, Fred Weber is uh, considered as uh, like the father of uh, modern common science. So these are various uh, uh, models of uh, the common nucleus. This is uh, what was envisioned by uh, another scientist based on uh, uh, Fred Peoples uh, model and then uh, during the Halley encounter time uh, based on the results uh, there were different uh, uh, competing models were proposed. But still we don't know for sure what the nuclear structure is. So for example if you want to mitigate a comet which is heading towards us. Uh, it has to be a new comet uh, because uh, the comet, the periodic comets that we know, uh, we know they are orbits. Uh, so uh, there is nothing which is going to be in the near future. But uh, if something coming towards us, uh, we need to know the structure in order to uh, do an effective mitigation strategy. So. Uh, uh, actually, I will skip this uh, just now. running a little bit late. And uh, so, uh, late 20th century and early 21st century, there are a lot of uh, advances in uh, comet science. Uh, so, this has happened primarily due to three reasons. One is there were multiple spacecraft mission during the turn of the century. And also, the better ground-based observing facilities and primarily the instrumentation. Remember, CCDs were used, the CCDs that you have in your uh, camera, point and shoot camera or DSLR. Uh, those were first used in uh, astronomical uh, experiments or observations uh, in the 1980s, uh, about the time uh, when Comet Halley uh, was uh, close to Earth. Uh, and also, of course, the telescopes, uh, they got uh, larger and larger. But uh, more than the telescopes, it is the instruments which had, uh, uh, have been uh, understanding of uh, uh, what comets are. 
and uh, finally the better computing facilities, faster computers, you can do a uh, lot of uh, numerical uh, simulations. So that helped a lot too. So uh, next I will show you some pictures of uh, space mission to comets. Uh, the, uh, except the very last one which happened uh, the last uh, two, three years, uh, which I am not showing here because that is a, a mission, which is an orbiting mission. Uh, these are all uh, images of the common nuclei which are taken by flyby spacecraft. So the first one was common Halley and then uh, common Borelli. Uh, this was 1986, common Borelli in 19... Uh, for 2001 and then uh, we will do uh, Temple 1 and then Hart 2. Actually, this is to the, these are to the same scale, so Hart 2 is relatively small compared with all the other comments. So, um, so each uh, mission gave us some answers to questions we had, but the way science works, you do a lab experiment or you do observations, you solve one problem and there are other problems or other questions. So, uh, so this is a common tally uh, and uh, one of the major results is the confirmation that its albedo is near 4%. That means it reflects only about 4% of the light which impacts on it. So, common nuclei are really, really dark. Uh, dark than the asphalt, the road surface. Uh, so, that may be due to two reasons. One is it is really black and the other reason, most likely, it is very fluffy. And also, this is in what, what we call the first comet or first small body to be identified as a non principal axis rotational state. That means uh, it is not in a relaxed rotation state. It is sort of uh, uh, in layman's uh, uh, language, uh, you can call it uh, a tumbling object. Uh, I personally don't like the tumbling. That is why I call the non principal axis rotation. So, if something is in the least energetic, most stable rotation, it would just rotate around the shortest axis like that. But this object is not doing that. Now, there are uh, other uh, asteroids as well as comets uh, we know in this uh, particular rotational state. Uh, and then, uh, Common Borei, again an elongated object. Uh, the reflectance or the albedo was different throughout the surface. The, you could see some geological features and uh, these jets coming out. Uh, this, this is in the continuum, that means uh, uh, basically we are seeing dust here, not gas, gases. Because if you want to see gas, you have to use that particular a particular filter which separates that particular wavelength, but uh, this is a broadband filter. Uh, they have image deep space uh, spacecraft. Uh, so this can be traced back to where it is coming from, the nucleus. So uh, in 2004, uh, there was a Stardust mission. These are two. Uh, TV images and they collected uh, some of the particles from the coma, dust particles, and they brought back. And uh, one of the significant results from analyzing those dust particles was various minerals form that uh, that you can find in the dust grains. Uh, they were formed both far and close to the sun. So the implication is there was significant mixing 
going on in the solar nebula when the solar system was forming. Then uh, Comet Temple 1, uh, so there was a uh, there was an uh, uh, experiment done here. Uh, a bigger, big copper object was smashed into the comet and uh, trying to understand the interior structure. Uh, not entirely, but to a certain extent. And uh, actually, the principal investigator of this uh, project uh, was my uh, PhD advisor, but uh, it was after I, I had done my PhD. Uh, so, uh, there, were, uh, there were the nucleus, the surface of the nucleus had few ice patches. Elsewhere, it was covered with dust. So, uh, that is the dust mantling that I was talking about. Uh, uh, Asok and his student uh, was working on, and of course, later on, there were many others worked on that, that aspect too. Uh, so, So there were a lot of results. I'm not going to go into details. It's I'm running a little behind. Uh, and then the spacecraft deep impact, which encountered uh, uh, Comet Temple One, it had uh, little extra fuel. So NASA decided, okay, we will fly another uh, fly by another comet. So that was Comet RT2 in 2010 from uh, the. The mission was renamed epoxy, but the spacecraft was still in impact. Uh, and there, this is the very small nucleus, and there was uh, CO2 and ices coming out, uh, and water vapor coming out from here, and there is uh, water ice. So, uh, if you look at uh, different uh, species have different uh, uh, yeah, they are coming out from different areas. So, um, one thing, uh, uh, a long-standing problem uh, which fascinated a lot of people is, was uh, where did water on Earth originate from? So, there were few measurements of deuterium to hydrogen ratio, that is one way of finding out. Uh, uh, water due to the hydrogen ratio uh, in comets. So that can be compared with the deep H ratio in seawater. So it turns out for hard H2 it was very similar. So people thought, oh, uh, comets should have contributed a lot of water to Earth. Uh, but later on, I was so, uh, show a slide which will indicate that that is not necessarily the case. There's a range uh, of deep wedge ratios uh, among comets. And uh, then the Stardust mission, which flew by Comet Will 2, uh, it had little fit extra fuel. So, NASA decided to fly by Comet Temple 1, which was image by uh, the deep impact spacecraft to see what has happened during one orbit. So, so the deep impact was, ta was taken this event, July 2005, and then the Stardust next, it was renamed the Stardust Race. Start us next uh, in 2011, and you can see these features change on the surface due to sublimation of ices on the surface. Uh, and then uh, during the turn of the century, there was new understanding and uh, trying to categorize uh, what are the new uh, what sorry what are the various type of comets and where they come from because there are two uh, reservoirs of comets. One is the so-called hyperbelt. Those are basically objects beyond uh, Pluto. 
sorry, the, the beyond Neptune, um, and uh, uh, those are called hypervariant objects. And then uh, there are objects called scattered disk objects, which are inclined further away from the plane of the solar system. And uh, so those are contributing uh, these comments. And then uh, comments like uh, Halley and uh, uh, New comments, uh, they are presumably be coming from the old cloud, which is much further out. Nobody has seen the old core cloud. It is just postulated. Uh, and uh, so that is basically between uh, our sun and the nearest star. But uh, it is basically surrounding our sun at much larger distance. So then uh, that dynamical classification, uh, the question is, will it fit with uh, the chemical classification? So uh, there are, uh, when we look at uh, the abundance of various uh, molecules, like uh, the abundance of C2 molecules, which is seen in commas, the coma, coma of commas, and CN, when you take that ratio, uh, it was found there were different uh, patterns. So the question is uh, whether that parameter classification is consistent with what we see from classical uh, classifications. So this work is still ongoing and there is no definite conclusion yet. But what I'm trying to say is uh, we have Despite that, we have made much more progress uh, 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 in common science, uh, trying to understand the uh, comets as objects. Uh, and also, uh, this is the uh, volatile budget that means different ices. So it is primarily what ice, and the next two, it could be either CO or CO2 depending on the common and then there are a lot of other minor species. Uh, so this would be as large as 10 to 20 percent CO CO2. And uh, one interesting fact is uh, comments have very low albedos, that means reflectance is very low. Uh, they reflect typically 0.2 to point, sorry, typically 2% to 6% of light incident from there. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, in the case of uh, common Kali, they are very dark, the surface is fluffy, and uh, uh, it was uh, confirmed by the uh, Procedure Mission 2. And if you look at the colors of comets, most comet nuclei are redder than the sun. That is an indication that uh, probably there is a lot of organic material. When I say organic, not life, but uh, any complex carbon containing uh, molecules. And uh, next I will talk about the Rosetta mission. That is the most extensive common mission today. Uh, so, common, uh, Rosetta mission is actually not a NASA mission. It is a European Space Agency mission, but there were a couple of uh, NASA instruments. Uh, so, it, it went common to uh, Chilemeo Gerasimenko. Uh, Six, six, seven P means this P stands for theory. So this is a nomenclature of how uh, we I, uh, name uh, periodic comets. So it's the first mission to land on a comet because it was it had a lander, but it didn't work perfectly. So the lander won't rise uh, because uh, the surface was 
harder than the indigenous thought and uh, they could not anchor because remember this is an object which is only a few kilometers across so we are working in microgravity so uh, and then uh, also uh, as far as the science is concerned we had a very accurate bulk density for the comet because the, it was orbiting the nucleus so you can get uh, accurate uh, orbit changes and from that you can determine uh, the mass of the object and also from the images you can determine the shape of the object so you can get uh, very good uh, bulk density and uh, prior to this uh, the densities of comets were uh, estimated from the non-gravitational forces. I have done a lot of uh, uh, that work and uh, from that I can tell you uh, uh, the error bars are pretty fairly large. However, we were confident because uh, between from 0.1 cc uh, gram per cc to 1 gram per cc and that was confirmed and actually the number is about uh, uh, somewhere around 0.5 that means half the density of water so there has to be a lot of porous space in the nucleus uh, maybe micro porosity not, not huge uh, uh, points but we don't know whether there, is, uh, there are uh, meter size points because uh, there was an experiment, a radar experiment uh, to do nuclear tomography like CG scan. Uh, that experiment could not be done properly because uh, the land was part of it and the land didn't uh, land as planned. Uh, so the estimate that they have is there are the nucleus density is uniform at 10 meter scale. So, there can't be uh, large points, 10 meter or large, but uh, meter scale, we don't know. So still there are a lot of unknowns. Uh, and I will show some pictures. So this is the nucleus, one of the most weirdest shapes that uh, we are seeing for an object. Uh, is that what you see at the end, the impact crater or something like that? No, no. Uh, this is, uh, this area is uh, probably, actually, uh, even among the Rosetta uh, team, there is ongoing debate with the, this, uh, now I'm going to show the next uh, slide, it probably is a little bit better. Uh, okay. There is a smooth area in between, like a neck. So this is whether this slope is different to this slope. That means two lobes merge, merge and form a single object. So that is the leading idea right now. And uh, uh, I heard a rumor uh, because uh, there was a uh, meeting uh, la uh, last month actually in Uruguay, uh, Montevideo uh, on uh, comments, uh, sorry, asteroids, comments and videos and uh, nobody mentioned that but they are, uh, the, they are, but the view is the density of for this globe is different to the density of uh, this globe but not, not by very much but with the error pass they are different. So if that is the case, that is strong evidence. Uh, I mean, of course, with the caveat, if that is right, we don't know yet. Uh, they were formed by merging the two lobes. Uh, and uh, there is a lot of activity in this decade. So what, what about those other sort of like craters that sort of things are those? Those are um, uh, like the pit line. Yeah. Um, so uh, th uh, there is, those ones are most likely 
due to acne. And uh, so, in fact, uh, I think the next slide or the slide after that. So, uh, you can see uh, this is uh, this is that neck area. This is one lobe here. This is uh, dark because it is of the shadowing. And then the other lobe. So, in between, you can see these uh, uh, streams of uh, material. Uh, basically, it is taken in continuum. So, this represents dust uh, coming out from. So, of course, when dust is coming out like that, you have to have ice as sublimating and gas coming out. That is what drives the dust out into the pore. So, okay. uh, in fact, uh, there are huge sink uh, like uh, pits. Uh, so, there is this uh, 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 debate going on in the community right now what they represent. Uh, one thing to note is uh, I was reviewing. Uh, couple of papers, but so I don't want to go into uh, much details. Uh, but just to point out, uh, uh, there's a lot of uh, sublimation happening from the walls of these pits. Uh, so, and uh, so somehow, these pits are associated with activity. But exactly how they form, why that shape, we didn't figure out. So uh, there are a lot of uh, geologists, there are a lot of geologists also involved in this process uh, because uh, this is an exercise.